Now it's upon us. Uh, we are here at the VC Unicorn panel, and uh, I want to uh, uh, welcome my guests, which are Hélène Fortier, um, Cyril Bertrand, and Jonathan Uzerovici. And uh, maybe you folks could uh, introduce yourself to the panel. Yes, happy to start. So thank you for yeah. your, your invitation for joining this panel. Hélène Falchier, I am, Portage at, I am partner at Portage. Portage is a global fintech fan, and I am based in, in, in Paris and cover Europe and the insurtech space for, for, for the Portage, Portage panel. Great, welcome then. So Cyril, maybe you can continue. Yeah, so uh, I'm running a Franco-German fund uh, based in uh, Paris and Munich, uh, 500 million under management, early stage. So I'm an early stage guy, seed and series A, <laughs> and uh, very happy to be there together Thank with uh, John and Ellen. Yes, welcome. So John, up to you, welcome. Thanks for the invitation, Thomas. So I'm Jonathan uh, Uzerovici, and I'm a partner at eVentures. So we are a global venture firm early stage and growth uh, based in San Francisco with offices in Paris, London, Berlin, as well as in Latin America and Asia. And so I'm the head of the Paris office and covering the South Europe, European Southern region um, and based in Paris. And you know, John was chosen for this job, of course, partly based on his last name, Uzerovici. Very good. Exactly. <laughs> well, an old joke several times repeated. Well, come on, let's start it off. Venture capital for me is very important, I must say. So I have been an attorney in the space of PE buyouts, venture capital for many years. But uh, I, I always love to represent the VCs because their transactions. Were, were, were always had an edge, were very interesting. And uh, for one time, I even represented, we can discuss it, eVentures, John's, John's uh, GP too. And that's, that's Europe apparently, and the US, if you said you are sort of a hybrid with the base in San Francisco where I met Christian many, many years ago. That was, that was the start of it, interestingly enough. And the question always is US versus Europe, you know, originating from the valley, partly the first generation on there, like Sutter Hill Ventures, the other, any of them still in the game, still part of the game, which is exciting. And then uh, apparently there is talent in Europe as well. So what maybe you can do the round and, and John, we start with you now that we talk, uh, what is your take on the suitability of the ecosystem? Meaning you are a founder, you set up your company and one of you is in San Francisco and the other one in Paris who has an edge and how comes yeah I mean I, I think that's a very interesting question and uh, I mean our DNA is to be on the on the one hand in San Francisco and in Europe at the same time and so uh, eventually started in the US as you said because the local ecosystem there is much more matured or was at least much more mature you know, 20 years ago when we started, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know what what we've noticed in the in the past five to ten years is that this is changing, and as every kind of VC firm is saying today, uh, the you know global leaders in new categories really can come from anywhere. So in the past years, we have seen very interesting hubs, of course, in London, in Paris, in mm -hmm. Berlin, in the Nordics. And the recent trend, and especially with the COVID, is that now that we see also remote first companies in that, you know, you have basically access to talent everywhere in the world, um, should you be in Paris or in Bucharest, as, you know, UiPath is, uh, we see many, many more hubs, you know, uh, where we can, you know, where we detect new, com very promising companies. So now you can really build a very, very ambitious and global company really from anywhere. And uh, I don't think, you know, being in the US uh, is today as, as strong as an edge as it was like 10 or 15 years ago. So this has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really a question of connectivity too, you know, all the, all the apps that you folks invent, they, they, they really empower the people. Um, so, uh, Yes, very good. And then, Hélène, what about you? What do you think? I mean, being Paris-based, is this satisfactory or other things, you know, regulatory issues that you would say that we really could ease your burden in taking on a nurturing portfolio companies? 
Yes, sure. So uh, I totally align with, with what, what Jonathan said. I think it's more mature now. Uh, the, the, the European market with experience on uh, entrepreneurs, interesting projects, great ecosystem in terms of financing also. So we have seen the, the Q1 uh, as are the flying start in terms of financing. Mm -hmm. The question mark is the exit market in Europe, but yeah. uh, in yeah. terms of, yeah, for, for, for the fintech space, of course, the regulation is not the same between Europe uh, Europe, the US and North America globally. So, but I think we can start a really good, yeah, really good business everywhere. So uh, at, at, at Portage, we are global. So one, one of our, uh, one, one partners is based in Singapore, um, in San Francisco, in Canada and so on. I think keeping this global overview of, of what's happening in this market, it's, it's super interesting. It is, it is. It creates a lot more options. So, Cyril, do you agree too? Is it really a level playing field, a global level playing field? Is the world flat in terms of VC productivity and returns? Well, I think our big uh, colleagues in the US uh, have uh, now taken Europe seriously. Um, and uh, it was not necessarily uh, as, uh, as clear as it is, as it is today, uh, let's say 10 years ago. Now we see the big funds, uh, they were active in London already for some time, but now they are active in, uh, in Berlin for sure, and, uh, and in Paris uh, step by step. So um, I think the level of, uh, of deals done or led by uh, non-German investors in Germany, for instance, is far above 50% now. So uh, I think it's, uh, it's very clear that uh, the big US guys uh, are very, very much active in Europe now, which is That's one true. way to answer your question. Yes, yes, and it's interesting, you know, how did it start in Germany with the second generation VCs, right? Uh, I mean, the rocket internet guys, they, they did their MBA thesis on the US VC system and what you can learn from there. And they have a, and apparently they have a specific strategy, but um, that was the basis for many more young guys to say, well, it's possible, maybe we follow a different strategy in Berlin, but that, that is part of the root of our ecosystem here. That's interesting. So Cyril, if we stay with you, I mean, Elaine mentioned, you know, uh, a base in Singapore and Singapore apparently has GIC private and Temasek, which are LPs that are very active, both in the PE and VC space. What about European? What about French investors? When you look into your LP base, are they already set for VC too, like the large insurers, pension funds, and so on, just from, from your investor base? Yeah. So I'm raising uh, fund number four for uh, exchange. Uh, so I'm, I'm in the middle of it as we speak. Um, and I can testify that absolutely, yes, uh, we have a, a majority of uh, national LPs, uh, French mm -hmm. and uh, German. Uh, we have uh, three insurances uh, among our own uh, investors. Uh, we have a, a couple of banks and also um, a lot of corporates. So, um, uh, you know, we, we have a mix basically in, in Europe of, uh, of, of those uh, investors. I think all of them fairly well, um, uh, fairly competent now with uh, the VC asset class. Mm -hmm. Good. So then, then you successfully raise money and then it has to be invested now that we're we're closing Q1 2021. Uh, I mean, John, what does the situation look like in terms of valuations? You know, apparently a lot of activity is chasing the best transactions, our valuations more and more on the uptick. Yeah, I mean, wh when it comes to valuation, you know, it's uh, so we are also in the market where it's a question of supply and demand. And uh, for sure, because, you know, we have seen very successful exits and great companies being built and bigger and bigger and larger and larger exits also in Europe. Uh, we have seen a lot of money coming in because of that. And, um, and so because there is a lot of money uh, in the market, valuations are also, you know, increasing for sure. Um, now, uh, and competition on the deals is for sure also increasing, uh, you know, on the best deals. What you say is also true is that Basically, we see most of the money flooding in the same companies. So I would say I would say that 
the bar is of course higher and higher, but when you have a good company with experienced founders capable of attracting very good talents, you know, and with very good traction and economics, then a lot of funds want to invest. And this is making the valuation uh, increasing. Now, uh, a lot of, you know, founders are also, when, when they don't, you know, pass that very high bar, some founders also struggle to raise. So it's really uh, a race to the kind of the top companies and the top companies, the conviction is that we see more and more, you know, valuation uh, approaching the 100 billion uh, bar for the best companies like Stripe. So, uh, so the fact that valuation are increasing are not such a problem if, you know, we see bigger and bigger companies that are being, being built uh, locally in Europe. Right. And um, I think, yeah, yeah. Um, Helen, what, what can you add for the valuations? I mean, sometimes we think, you know, remembering the 2000s, this is all crazy, but I think the switch in the model is that you look at Amazon and, and we were always told by Jeff Bezos, you know, you just wait, you know, I build a platform here and I will make losses and losses and losses for years to come, but then we will hit it big time. And I think it's not about, you know, the VC conman of, of the very first days, but it's just how long would you like to stay in before we have built a platform? And if we are number one, uh, uh, we talk about winner takes it all in a minute too. Um, so, uh, what uh, what is your take on valuations, Elena? In, in, in terms of valuation, I, I, yeah, there is more and more competition, and and that's why there is less. Uh, I I think le less spread between the US and the Europe and market in terms of valuation. Uh, it's interesting to 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 see these trends. I think what what we can do, we 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 need to to have the right risk return as a VC mm -hmm. as a VC investor. Mm -hmm. So how we can mitigate this risk? This is a, the only question we, we we have when we when we are doing an investment with with high valuation. So um, at at Portage we have one answer, but I think we can find uh, a lot of different answers for for mitigate the risk. We have built a, a strong operating team with our own CTO, Chief Security Officer, VP mm. Sales, Head of Growth. Um, these people, yeah, they're all coming from the, the FinTech space because we are um, a, a specialist focused on FinTech. We can build this kind of team. So that's how we, we mitigate the risk of, of valuation. But this is, yeah, it's interesting to see, to see the trends and there is no crystal ball in terms of valuation for the future, I think. So it's it's pretty difficult to just stop stop investing, even if if this is a high high yeah high valuation market. Yeah, so yes. Cyril, did you did you get away from a tenant action recently because you said, well, it's really, really attractive business model, but it's really the price is crazy, so we'll not do it, or is that seldom the case? We, we kind of um, uh, decided to focus on the early stage uh, side mm -hmm. of the business. So uh, my impression, but I'm happy to hear the views of others, is that the, 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 the epicenter of the, of the valuations is on, on the growth uh, segment, uh, because uh, the, the US guys, are primarily uh, focused on, on growth, and uh, and there are some also some in incentives both in France and Germany to uh, to go after uh, B stage or C stage uh, investors investments. So we um, we decided to uh, to start earlier and and start at seed stage, uh, where of course there is still an inflation on valuation, so uh, the same phenomenon as the one uh, John just described. So uh, basically. Uh, more money on the same amount of, of companies. It's amazing that, uh, to see that you, you, the number of deals is not increasing, but the volume of investment is increasing. So, uh, which means that the, the, the tickets are increasing, the size of the tickets. So, uh, I'm doing early stage. I'm doing seed and Series A essentially, and um, uh, I hope that uh, we can also benefit uh, from a European perspective. Uh, from the, the 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 bigger tickets because we need uh, let's face it we need bigger tickets if we are to uh, fight at a global level right so 
I'm glad to have this panel, you know, and I believe we have one woman. And so let's talk about a little bit how to maybe push the the uh, the uh, the rate of women, the percentage of women in VC leadership positions. I mean, John, there there was an IPO recently, right, of a kind of a female Tinder. I guess you guys were involved as investors. But Elin, basically, I mean, uh, um, what what is the chance for VC GPs? How should they really proceed in the right way to increase the number of women? I mean, the easy answer is hire them, hire them. But are there enough? We had this discussion, you know, women in finance. Are there enough women, even for you, you know, when you hire and you say, you know, I want to make it 50-50 one day, is there enough potential then, just from your own business? Do you want me to take that one? Oh, Elaine, I thought. Elaine, yeah. Yeah. Yes, there is enough. Yes, there is. You, you can find you can find really talented women in this space. So I think this is not a question of talent. Uh, this is also. Um, I think there is there is a lot of uh, a lot of VC who really want to increase the diversity into the team, and I think this is not only the parity. This is a question of the diversity into the team. So um, we. Stop signing the charters and and all these uh, commitments. So I think we need key results now in terms of diversity and parity in this space. Uh, I think this is this is something across private equity, not only uh, not only in VC across private equity. So I am part of Level Twenty, for example. So mm -hmm. a great association, and yeah, they have made an amazing work to see. Um, how we, yeah, how, how a, a VC or a P firms can can hire more women, and the BA the, the BA there is today uh, in the in the in the recruitment. So I think it's super interesting. Um, at at Portage, we have set targets to 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 increase the diversity footprint across our team, of course. So we are two two uh, women at at partners level because. Um, there is a lot of talent, but the issue is at sea level, and and also increase, um, yeah, in, in our portfolio. So focus on, on specific underrepresented courts, not only women, but uh, across diversity and, and inclusion. I, this is something super super important for us because this is a vision for the future, uh, especially in fintech. Um, we know that there is not a lot of diversity in financial services also. So we think that mm. fintech is the financial services of the future. We really need to have a yeah, diverse, diverse footprint, diverse city in, in, into the fintech space to build something different than what we have now. So I haven't I haven't um, clear answer for that. I think this is the responsibility of yeah of all of us. Mm. Yes, so that sounds good. I mean, uh, apparently you are a woman. And I talked to, to Sophie Chateau, uh, as you mentioned, Level 20 the other day, and Sophie uh, said that uh, actually Level 20 is very successful in France, next to UK, maybe the most successful country branch because the mentorship programs are a huge success. So there are many senior men too that say, yeah, I, I really accept it well, because you know, diversity drives performance. It's not that I do something good, it really drives performance. So we have to increase the number of women in our team. So maybe Joan and then also Cyril, what do you do in your team to increase the number of women in leadership positions? So we try to hire Helen basically, yeah? Yes, <laughs> very good. You know, uh, we are we are hiring. Uh, you know, we we make a, a, a positive discrimination in favor of uh, of uh, the female talents. Basically, yeah, I think yeah. it's and, and that's not specific to Exchange. I think every single investor is doing uh, the same uh, right now um, in in Europe. Are you LPs asking you to do that? Have you Absolutely, learned? they take very much uh, care of of that aspect as well, uh, both parity and diversity. So uh, so mm -hmm. you know, it's another incentive. But I think, uh, to be honest, I think uh, diversity also uh, is uh, improves uh, the, the returns, improves the, the, the financial yeah. performance. So uh, we also do that uh, because we, we believe in it. 
Yeah. And, and I would add, you know, uh, outside yeah. of the investment team, which is, a, you know, of course, a focus, it's also about, you know, financing, you know, female entrepreneurs and female CEOs. So, yeah, one of them is, of course, a self made uh, billionaire uh, CEO of Bumble, which just did the yes, exactly. IPO. And we were, you know, lucky to be part of that story. But uh, it's generally speaking, you know, funding female CEOs and female co founders and entrepreneurs, but also, uh, we like to co-invest with business angels and have, having diverse cap tables with, uh, you know, female um, uh, business angels in our startups. It's also important. So it's really, you know, uh, working just with diverse teams all over the supply chain of the, the venture kind of supply chain. Yes. Um, Jordan, maybe we stay with you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about sectors now. You know, apparently returns come from certain businesses that are active in certain sectors. And um, it's uh, it's IT mostly. I mean, life sciences, just to spend some words on it, uh, on the uptick right now, apparently, you know, with the vaccine story, they get huge investments. And uh, it's 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 based basically on becoming more and more of a modular system so that you can bind stuff and and ecosystem service that parts to really generate returns i was active in the space of uh, uh, seed funding of of life science companies for a number of years and it was really so hard in the late 80s you know 90s and um, yeah, and uh, 2000 still when I was when I was a lawyer then I, I really had to deal with those transactions. It was really slow. And but now the technique of, of bringing bringing medications to the market, how to survive uh, phase three, the strategies. I mean. It's artificially intelligence adding to the bill. But uh, now let's talk about some very special areas and which potential you see, particularly in software as a service. We talked briefly about platform. Let's talk about SAS and subscription models. What are the hot topics there currently, John? Yeah, I mean, uh, SaaS, you know, is a, is a good part of, uh, of our investment strategy and of the investment of strategy of a lot of funds because the beauty of the, the SaaS models is generally that, you know, revenues are recurring. Uh, and as we like to say, you know, software is eating the world. So, uh, so the, the, the part of uh, the market shares of softwares is just growing, you know, tremendously. And so inside, um, you know, this business model, so the software as a service like companies, there are lots of areas we are, we are looking at. Um, so maybe a few examples, you know, uh, are um, everything related to the enterprise data infrastructure or data stack. So, you know, we have like so many data today, so much data in every company that um, uh, companies are now trying to, you know, kind of warehouse the data, uh, put them in the same place in the company, uh, use, you know, data quality tools to make sure the data is qualitative and clean. And so they can put this data in, uh, artificial intelligence models uh, in the different you know segments of the company. So I think everything related to helping companies uh, clean um, and uh, and uh, and warehouse and work uh, intelligently with this data is a topic we're very closely looking at now because uh, it's really growing at a very fast pace. Uh, another area is also and and this exploded also with COVID is every tool that is used by SMEs. So we are looking a lot uh, also because there are some European specificities here uh, that make sense at all the tools and CRMs or vert vertical SaaS that can help small companies. So it can be shops, it can be online shops or offline shops. It can be any type you know, of, uh, of uh, small SMEs to thrive and be more efficient. And mm -hmm. we feel that you know all the entrepreneurs we have in Europe who are like, at the head of this SMEs now are ready to utilize these new tools. And so this is a new stack that we really like. And, and the third maybe, um, you know, uh, segment that we really love and we also have, you know, this kind of unfair and competitive advantage in Europe is everything related to payment. So maybe I, I'll let Hélène, you know, uh, uh, talk yeah. a bit further about this because uh, she's uh, even more specialized in this topic, but it's also a strong focus for us. Uh, so everything related to, to the payment infrastructure or helping, you know, companies or SMEs pay 
uh, in more flexible terms and easily and uh, and uh, online is something that we look at very carefully as well. Really interesting that you're also going a bit Mittelstand, you know, with, with this offering a little SAP PeopleSoft things and then MailChimp even, you know, they're not only producing our uh, newsletters and, and do the circulation, they have a lot of add-on tools really for the sole business owner to survive in these days and strive. So let's then really move on, Elen. What, what, are, what are the hot picks, the hot topics in the area of financial services in 2021? So we really like the wealth, wealth management space. So we have seen new, a new company uh, around trading, uh, trading as a service. Um, it could be, could be trading stocks, but also crypto money and, and so on. So it's mm -hmm. super interesting. We are uh, one of the major investors in this space in Canada with Wealthsimple. Mm -hmm. So um, Canadian robo advisor and, and, and trading platform. And we really like this space and, and I, I I hope we can do an investment in this space in 2021 in Europe, because I think there is yeah, more and more things in, in wealth management in Europe. It's pretty interesting also to see, um, there is a lot of things around savings, and now with the new retirement, uh, retirement plan, I think in terms of decumulation, how you can help people in, in, in the decumulation phase at the end of the life and optimize this. So I think, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Align with Jonathan about, about the payment. Uh, I think payment is really including every business. So um, can we have more verticalized payments? So this is a, a real question. Uh, we have made one investment in, in buy now, pay later space. So uh, BNPL space is, is, is an hot, um, hot segment right now um, to help consumer, um, yeah, and to help merchant increase 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 their capacity. Uh, so it's, it's super interesting. Um, we like I like personally the, the insurance space. I think that the um, the insurance the, the insurance segment um, you can build a lot of innovation because they are not customer centric yet. So you can you can mm -hmm. find a lot of opportunity in terms of investment. It could be full stack. Uh, there is a lot of space into the value chain of, of the insurtech. So you can be full stack, MGA, brokers, but you can also uh, create really interesting, uh, really, really interesting tools in claims management. Uh, so uh, or in fraud. So it's, I think a uh, really broad, broad segment also. So yeah, That's I think so. there is a space of a lot of innovation uh, in, in, into, into the fintech. I agree. I, you know, I, I just look at my apps here and I have one uh, Captize Pro, right? Which you can scan everything, the documents that you sometimes have to show to to a public service agency, something like that. And that would keep work well with insurance policies, you know, to have them all in your portfolio, you know what you currently have when you need to check, uh, am I insured for a claim, what are the conditions? And that could lead your portfolio, of course, to be challenged by other, other insurance companies having better offers for you. So I'm, I'm quite with you from the, from the personal user perspective. Um, interestingly, you mentioned that in Canada, and I was thinking about, you know, French speaking Canada, are there closer connections? You know, apparently there are the big pension funds like Ontario Teachers, CPPIB, maybe French speaking Canada. Are there, are there closer relations uh, compared to other, other European companies that are that's really new to me? I don't know. Or is it just another country for you? <laughs> No, it, it's not just another country for us because this is um, so. Portal, Portage wa was launched in 2016 by two Canadian entrepreneurs, ah, okay. Adam Felisky and, and Paul Desmarais. So yeah, we, we are <laughs> we have two offices there, one in Montreal and, and another one in Toronto. So it's yeah, it's really an interesting and. Yeah, we are most most part of the team is based in Canada. This is really an, 
uh, important, yeah, in, in, in important country for, for us, part of our yeah. DNA at Portage. Yeah. Hopefully you have become an ice hockey fan then by now. No. <laughs> um, Cyril, what about the deep tech area? What are what are interesting developments there? What are really sub-specializations that you would want to invest to in 2021, next year too, maybe? Well, deep tech is, uh, is making a comeback, uh, I would say, because uh, in the 90s, uh, venture was actually almost only deep tech. Uh, uh, and now it's coming back. Uh, I think it, it's also becoming faster because one of the drawbacks of, uh, of uh, deep tech was the, 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 life, the, the, the time it took to, to come to, uh, mat to maturity. Now it's getting better. And um, the nice thing about deep tech is it has intersections with many of the topics we have already discussed. For instance, uh, deep tech and uh, fintech uh, can produce uh, a deal like Ledger, for instance. We are happy investors in this uh, crypto deal called Ledger. Um, I think it is deep tech uh, under the control of my, of my colleagues, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's also a fintech. And deep tech has another intersection with, um, with uh, healthcare. Uh, which is uh, becoming even more uh, important those days. Um, we we have started making investments in uh, in companies like TreeFrog uh, in the stem cells uh, uh, sector. So uh, you know we we are an IT uh, team basically. So you would you could ask me uh, what are you guys doing in this space? You know we are completely uh, out of our. Uh, usual space but we we have the feeling that uh, technology and and digital technologies have something to say uh, now about uh, deep tech and even about healthcare so uh, uh, and it's not specific to exchange you, you can see a lot of other investors uh, doing the same so i think this specific intersection um, you know uh, it meeting stem cells for instance uh, mm -hmm. is, is is becoming uh, hugely interesting for many of us yeah and I mean, that's good. That That's a current topic, apparently, vaccination, healthcare, uh, and uh, gerocrates demand for healthcare services, too. And then, again, uh, the nature, the climate change issues. Is there, are there some apps on the rise which help you really to measure your sustainability footprint or your climate footprint? Is that a huge business or is it just something in demand more morally, but not, not currently one of the hot topics for new companies? Anyone invested in a ESG pure play with an IT spin currently? So, you know, again, an intersection which is interesting are the banks, uh, the, the neo banks, uh, which are focused on the on sustainable uh, mm -hmm. usage of, uh, of the funds. I'm sure Helen would, would have something to say about this one, because it's, again, an intersection of, uh, of uh, ESG and, uh, and fintech. Helen. Yeah, I, I think about ESG, uh, this, is, this is a real demand real trend this is not yeah this is not just tick the box this this is a, uh, a demand like now for for consumer even in the fintech space so i think it's very important as a vc is yeah this is an, an important topic in terms of investment thesis but i think it's it also important for us as an investor how we can measure our esg uh, criteria is part of our uh, of our investment decision right now. So uh, in terms of ESG, I think the S and the G, the, <laughs> the social and governance is something we really um, yeah we really measure and, and we can we can act for um, for increasing the uh, yeah this is the diversity the diversity topic we we already mentioned so. Um, in terms of environment and into the, the tech space, I think this is really an open question. Uh, what, what can we do um, to increase uh, the measurement of, of our impact on, on the environment? Yeah, really, really important, uh, I guess, you know, given, given the developments all over the world and the halt that we came to in, 
in the in the COVID phase too. Now, once we're invested in portfolio companies, apparently we think about the exit from from day one mainly, and there are several exit channels. Apparently, trade sales always there. Well, what about the IPO climate currently in Europe? versus the US, uh, maybe John, you can start on that one. And then to everyone, anyone involved with SPACs in the VC phase, or is this more for growth or even for buyouts? So what is your take on the public listing exit strategy in 2021? John, maybe you can start. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, the, the IPO scene is much more developed uh, in the US. And I mean, in our portfolio, you know, we've seen like three or four IPOs in the US in the past month. And, and uh, for now, not so many in Europe. I mean, IPO in, in Europe. So why? Because, you know, the, the, the market there in terms of public investors, it, it's much, much more mature. So um, it's also developing now in Europe. So when the company, you know, is very good and capable of attracting also international investors prior to the listing, uh, like companies like Adian, for example, which, which listed, you know, uh, in Europe and was founded in Europe, uh, it can work like extremely well, but we don't, we still don't have, let's say the systematic kind of machine that allows European companies to, uh, to IPO in Europe for now. So, I think, uh, I mean, in every country and in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the European Union, investors are all working hard to make that happen in the coming years and we'll see more and more successes, uh, but it will take a bit of time. And when it comes to SPAC, which is uh, another way of doing, you know, of, of, of you know, giving the possibility of a company to, uh, to, to, to become public, uh, same thing, it's much more mature in the US and much more SPACs are rated in the US. Um, I think that, it will also accelerate in Europe because SPACs investment managers see very interesting targets in Europe in terms of uh, profile of profitability, traction and growth, good numbers, good teams with uh, the sufficient scale. And uh, for example, only in France, I'm hearing of, of a lot of growth companies which are being approached to, you know, to be targets of SPACs. So it is something that is appearing and that will definitely accelerate, you know, in the coming month and especially in the 12, 24 coming month. Yeah, Cyril, maybe you take on the IPO question and the IPOs recently and uh, where were they? In, in, at Euronext or at Nasdaq, where, where do you IPO in these days? <laughs> So you know what, uh, we are actually preparing an IPO on the Paris Stock Exchange as we speak, uh, uh, above uh, 1 billion, so it's a significant one. Um, and I'm not sure I will be able to mention which one, but I, I'm pretty sure everyone knows now. So, um, so uh, you know, uh, very good news for the French market. Uh, it's a bit of a, of a specific case because um, uh, it, it's very important not only to have the investors as John was saying, uh, the investors are everywhere now. So the investors are not the problem. The problem is the is the analyst. Um, you, you have to have a, a pretty good number of analysts who understand the space. And in the case I mentioned, that's the case uh, in, in Paris. At the end, I had a, a pretty good uh, uh, you know, uh, level of uh, understanding in, in Europe as well. And uh, it's not the only case, actually, we have in the portfolio. We have two. We have another one preparing an IPO in Germany on the Frankfurter uh, uh, market as well. Uh, it's an e-commerce uh, play, uh, substantial valuation around 1 billion as well. So um, this is something which was almost unimaginable uh, five or 10 years ago. You know, uh, IPOs in Europe, uh, tech IPOs in Europe, hmm, forget it, you know, it will never happen. And now um, I suddenly see uh, a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I'm not saying it's, uh, it's as strong as in the US, of course, but uh, maybe now we are approaching uh, critical mass. Yeah, and um, I mean, we, we still have sort of the disadvantages of the atomized European market. And we, with the exception now of the UK in the Brexit age, right? Really looking at Amsterdam, particularly, I think is doing a good job. Then it's Paris, 
partly it's Frankfurt and, and Milan maybe for fashion startups, for digital fashion startups. So everyone should find its niche. It's not that bad at all, but the huge countries apparently are growing. And if you talk for Germany, talk for France about a 1 billion valuation, that's really, that's really encouraging, I must say. Um, so, um, yeah, and uh, we, we, we tapped on the spec question. Apparently, it's a phenomenon that's hugely attractive right now, but uh, it's, it's just a strategy, right? It's, the, it's about time to public market play, nothing else, and then you have to check for valuations, as always. Um, going back a bit, maybe, uh, to the investment strategies, I mean, we talked a bit about the markets, the online markets, and that market share um, is quite important. So maybe, Elen, uh, uh, when you see all, all of your potential portfolio companies, is this still growing, the trend, you know, that you want to uh, get market share in certain large countries and sort of a VC buy and build empire by means of dominating each market? Or is it growing the more about this genius type of VC portfolio company, you know, where they have a certain code like the Google search engine that could address any market. So you don't need to capture individual markets. Is it still a story of the platform business model? That would be maybe the question in a nutshell. I think it, it depends on the business model of the company mainly. And um, the winner takes all, for example, in fintech is less present because this yeah. is a regulated industry and, and that creates break. So, um, yeah, this is, this is mainly a question, question about, uh, about the business model. Uh, I think for, for, even for SaaS, for example, I'm not sure this is, uh, this is a winner takes all. And it depends also of the maturity of, of, of the investment company. At the seed, seed stage, I think really early stage, this is more local, local play than a global play, but it's, it's always interesting to, uh, to think more broadly and to see how we can expand the, the, the business. Uh, is it in Europe? Is it, but yeah, it, it's really a question of, of, of the business model and, and also of the quality of the team, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any other of our treasured guests has a perspective on that? I mean, apparently, it's no secret, I think, about the food delivery, delivery, you know, where they buy into their markets and spend a lot of money first. And that is kind of a winner takes it all because. You will only remember probably one app. You will install only one app. And I think we elaborated of this in a prep session a little bit. And I think, John, wasn't it that you said, you know, rightly, I mean, you still need the best technology, the best algorithm. You're not going to some company for pure market share. And that's, that's reassuring, I think, you know, in terms of free enterprises and helping the little VC to uphold its business. Um, good. Uh, I mean, um, this Europe versus the US or together with the US uh, system, I mean, Joan, you in any case have a large global network uh, being active in the, if I may say so, classic countries, you know, like France, like Germany, the US, but also smaller countries where you see market chances. Uh, how does it work? Uh, uh, one day in your office, I mean, how do the interactions with the other offices look like? Give us a sneak peek into eVentures Paris when it comes to interacting with your colleagues in other offices. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, now, you know, we are uh, kind of, a, let's say, a remote first or remote friendly company because so most of my partners are all based in other countries. So we have partners on the ground in maybe 10 cities now in the world. And because we think when you are doing early stage, uh, it's really, really important to have someone on the ground helping you with the local recruitment capabilities, local uh, connections on the one side with our LPs, with big corporates, but also with scale-ups and startups, which can be clients. And on the other side with partners and local partners uh, could be, uh, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, could be a lot of different contacts that you have locally. And so our thesis and our goal is really to invest early in the company, in the companies, so they can have 
um, a local access, a local network, a local partner, but also leverage our international platform. And so uh, when, what I mean by international platform outside of the, all the tools we built um, for the firm is also just uh, the possibility for, let's say, a French startup to have access to you know, a very strong network in every city in Germany, for example, because my partners are there on the ground. So they network with C-levels that we can recruit. They network with a lot of LPs and corporates that we have there. They invested in tens and tens of companies of all size that can be partners or clients of this French startup and now financing. And so we really want to help, you know, our companies to be leaders in the field, either pan-European, either international, depending on the business model. And so uh, we you know, work on a day-to-day -day basis together uh, and communicate a lot to make that happen. And when it comes to the international platform, what is interesting is that you know, some trends come from the US, but some trends also come from Europe and some trends come from Asia, for example, in mobile payments. And so mm -hmm. we have you know, maybe two or three times a month, we have intelligence briefings that allow everyone in the team to detect the right trends in the right country that will arrive on your continent. And so we have you know, a sneak peek and a good view in advance to understand which trends are coming in, in, a, in a new continent or other. So you know, five or 10 years ago, it could be the neobanks, for example. Neobanks you know, with Revolut and Monzo were a trend coming out of Europe and that was, you know, came after that in the US. And a lot of software uh, innovations come from the US and we detect these trends in advance in Europe. Um, um, a very recent example is, uh, is uh, the food delivery in fifth, less than 15 minutes market. So the, the, you know, the, the leader in the field is GoPuff, which uh, we invested in, it's based in the US. And you know, they have a lot of work to do locally and it's already a $10 billion company. And so you have a lot of copycats and things that are created in Latin America and Asia and Europe now. And so we had kind of this information in advance, which allowed us to, to look at the market much before the other funds. And so that's what you, you get as an investor for the international platform and as a founder to take profit as you know, each country's network and, uh, and, uh, and local partners uh, network. Yeah. Um, I mean... We, we talked a lot about of, uh, uh, how the fund is raised, uh, how, uh, how its employees are qualified, male, female, how the teams work together. Let's talk about the portfolio companies and how they, how they find a good start. Let's talk about incubators. I think there is a, a huge one type of, you know, set up by a French telecoms uh, entrepreneur in Paris. There are others. I always hear, to be honest, well, with the incubators, you know, is that really helpful? There really were studies by Josh Lerner from Harvard that really said, you know, they are not that helpful, to be honest, if you look at the very successful companies that I eventually do an IPO. What are you just openly, what are your experiences with, uh, with the incubators, maybe uh, Hélène and then Cyril? Do they have relevance for you at all? <laughs> Relevant, honestly, I don't know. This is this is a match between um, yeah a team, uh, yeah management team, uh, and 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 not really the incubator. Of course, we receive deal flow from incubators, but this is more a match with with management team. Mm -hmm. uh, we have we have a venture builder in in Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, called, called Diagram, and, and we are we are really proud of them um, <laughs> because they've built, for example, an amazing uh, telemedicine company called Dialog, just listed, um, yeah, few few weeks ago. So uh -huh. at the Toronto uh, Stock Exchange. So so and um, yeah, created in, in 2016 by 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 Diagram. So I think this is yeah an amazing. Um, an amazing example of, of what they are doing. So we haven't, um, yeah, do or don't. This is really, we are really open to, 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 to that question. Yeah, Cyril, do you have a take on that? 
Yeah, we, we work a lot with uh, incubators and acceleration program. I put uh, the two of them in the same basket, right? Uh, mm -hmm, unless yes. you, you want to make a, a difference between them. But, um, but you know, uh, YC, Y Combinator is uh, doing an amazing job in the US. Uh, I think they, you know, it's now obvious that they have uh, initiated a lot of uh, billion businesses. So uh, we, we see a lot of, uh, of very good uh, incubators and accelerators in, in France and Germany. We work with all of them. Uh, they are very important, maybe uh, not only to produce uh, unicorns, but also to uh, educate a new generation of entrepreneurs. So uh, it's not only about the you know the unicorns in this game. It's also uh, that uh, we you know we need to create an ecosystem. Uh, we need to uh, to put everyone at the same level of information, uh, and and those guys are doing a, an enormous job uh, at that. Yes. And you mentioned one thing, education. Uh, what is the state of the nation of entrepreneurship education in France? I mean, if we look at the US again, there's a Babson College, you know, really, really a whole college founded around the entrepreneurial idea. There's the Kaufman Foundation that really is nurturing talent and which has a very important role in terms of the investor side, LP nurturing, making them ready for venture capital. How does that look like in France? I mean, I as a German don't know things. ASEAD doing uh, investor uh, VC education or HEC, where, where do you go when you want to become an entrepreneur and want to get educated as far as that is possible? I think it's now 35% of uh, the most uh, prominent uh, engineering and, and business schools in France who are saying, I want to become an entrepreneur uh, at the end of the school. 35% is a big number, right? Uh, yeah. It was probably less than 5% 20 years ago. So, um, so uh, still some, you know, some, some work to do uh, to, to have the first major dropout uh, of the universities. It's not yet something as uh, developed in France as it is at, uh, at Stanford, for instance. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but I think it's going to happen. Uh, I'm, and we are eagerly looking, uh, looking for that. Yeah. So maybe, John, if you do an analysis of your, your own portfolio companies that you are working on, with e-ventures, uh, what is the share of, uh, of people that, that have university degrees firstly, and how much have a commercial business degree background, engineering degree background, or others, you know, like IT studies or natural sciences? If you really take your thumb out, what would you say? I don't have that, you know, the data today, but what I can tell you is that when we look at a company, we generally, so we invest in tech companies, right? So yeah. generally speaking, uh, we have a tech co-founder and the natural uh, path to, uh, to, to be a tech co-founder is to, to go through, you know, a tech university at some point, even if you have, you know, some people who are kind of self-made uh, tech people, but in general speaking, they go to a, to a, to a strong tech university. So, to be honest, we, we, we didn't track that uh, recently because uh, it's not uh, an argument for us to make an investment. We really invest mm -hmm. in founders that are uh, strong, no matter the background, no matter the school. And uh, the important thing is, you know, capability of capacity of execution, of attracting talents, ambition, and uh, the willingness to build, you know, international companies. And uh, the correlation with the, the degree is not always, uh, always so strong. Uh, and it's even more true today compared to 10 years ago. And in France, when you look at the statistics uh, over the past years, uh, you, maybe you know, 10 years ago, most of the founders of the company, let's say, I think the statistic was like 33% of the founders were either had a degree from HEC, either from Polytechnique, so let's say the best kind of business school or the best engineering school. Uh, and today, uh, so the companies which, you know, attracted funding and today this, this number is decreasing also uh, massively. So, uh, so that's, that's the trend. Access to entrepreneurship is not only via, you know, good schools, uh, so. Apparently, and maybe we can no longer track the ENA figure soon, but that's a different story, apparently. And 
Uh, what about Asia? We talked briefly about Asia and their early Asian VC funds like Warden and so on, and mostly nurtured by Valley VCs too. Do you, uh, I mean, you talk about mobile payments, so do you guys cooperate with Asian VCs? Also the question, what are, what are your main collaborators? So do you uh, invest often alongside US VCs? Maybe John, you can just jump in and then maybe Ellen and Cyril. Yes, I mean, yeah, when it comes to US VCs, for sure, American VCs, and especially on the growth front, are more and more active in Europe. And we see, you know, fundraising of more than 100 million with US VCs, like increasing a lot in the past, uh, in the past month, in the past years. And, uh, and of course, I mean, we love working with uh, international VCs, either European, either US. And, uh, and for some companies and for some business models, it makes sense uh, at the beginning to co-invest with European VCs, you to lay the foundation, the good and strong local foundations. And after Series A to, partner up with US VCs to develop their set up an office, find you know, the first recruits and also connect with, with good people locally. So we love partnering with them on some business models which, which make sense and when they have to develop uh, in the US. And when it comes to Asia, um, so we have a, an early stage fund in Asia uh, that, that is also doing very well and that is specialized locally. And so for some business model and for some companies which also have you know, to take market share there, we help them go there and we really partner up with uh, local VCs and, uh, and local partners because there are lots of specificities, especially in China, for example, or in Japan. So Japan is a good example. We had one portfolio company called Farfetch um, with, uh, with whom Christian Label in my team worked a lot and he helped, you know, set up the Farfetch Japan with local partners and uh, with, uh, with, uh, by doing a JV there. And, uh, and so, and yeah, that's what we do. You know, we help companies when it makes sense go to, to international countries, but you have to work with local people for sure. Yes, before we move on, maybe I hear there's a question from the audience. Maybe the team can, can give us the question. Hello, Mark? Okay, I saw it on the side, anyway. Okay. Then maybe, uh, yeah, Ellen, do you, I mean, you talked about the Canadians, are there other international GPs that you frequently team up for cross-border transactions maybe or international expansion? We, yeah, I think the VC, the VC ecosystem is really a cooperative, cooperative ecosystem with the other. So I think we work a lot with other, with other VCs. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the US team, um, the Portage US team knows really well the, the, the US ecosystem. Um, my partners based in Singapore um, work really closely with the, with the Asian, Asian part of the ecosystem. So, I think yeah, it's it's really a global uh, a global global market, and it's interesting to to work as Jonathan said. It's, it's super interesting to to work with with local VC when you invest in in Asia and in the US. We are a sector focused fund, so we like to find um, a complementary VC, uh, compl yeah, complementary uh, to 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 us to what we are doing. Okay. okay, so Siri, maybe we have uh, one more uh, sentence because then we, we are done, I guess. <laughs> on the yeah, time. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, ah, the question from yes. the audience, please. So, lack of late stage fund and financing in the EU. Whose fault is it really? Lack of LP interest or GP not interested to look at the segment because of potentially lower returns in late stage investment? Uh -huh. So later stage investments and their attractiveness in Europe. Anyone idea about that? I, I, I think uh, it's the size I, question, because, right? Yeah. That you have nurturing, we are nurturing them uh, in Europe and then the big US gorillas come and bring them public, which used to be, I don't know if I understand this is the right question, but maybe that. No, I think I think it's so you know in Europe for, when it comes to the growth stage, 
um, we we it was I think more difficult in the past years to raise you know funds that as that are as big as in the U.S. Uh, because I think funds were a bit lacking money and. To be honest, there were also less opportunities five or ten years ago. Uh, now it's it's I mean changing massively. A lot of growth funds are now being raised in Europe, from you know, you know, 300 million size to a couple of billions. So this is going to change massively. And I think that what we were missing in the past years, meaning local European investors funding European companies at the growth stage, is now changing and happening. And so. I mean, there is GA, there is uh, Eurasio, and a lot of others, you know, European uh, teams that are going to fund these companies. And we see more and more LP interest on that front as well, because the opportunities are more and more interesting. And the multiples are also growing even on the growth side. So uh, I would say that this debate was, uh, I mean, we're still missing, you know, money compared to the US, I would say, but it's evolving quickly. And uh, from the inside, I have the strong a feeling that this will uh, this will change and we will see a lot of you know local european growth fund being built in the coming years all right so we're done already thank you thank you so much thank you helen cyril and john for the french capital risk forum here at private equity summit paris great to have you with us uh, enjoy maybe one or other panel and the Dorio Award, of course, you know, coming up at 4:40. Thank you so much. Maybe we meet each other in person then in Paris 2021. That would be great. Merci. Goodbye. Thank Bye. you, Thomas. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye.